Okay there, Chemistry 3111. We left off at uh, finishing up 21.3. Now we're going to look at section 21.4, which is the Claisen condensation. And it says here the esters undergo reversible condensations and or condensation reactions. We call these Claisen condensations. If you were to take this ester here, this ester is actually a commonly used solvent. It's called um, ethyl acetate. So this is ethyl, ethyl acetate. You know, we use it to run our TLC sometimes. But anyhow, if you put ethyl acetate in sodium ethoxide, you're going to have the ethyl acetate, but you're also going to have the enolate form, right? So if we draw the enolate, it's going to look like this. So there's our enolate, like this. And so it can act as a nucleophile and it can attack our uh, our other ester. And so you can see that that's where this um, clays and condensation product comes from, okay? So we get what we call a beta keto ester. So this would be the alpha carbon. This is the beta carbon. So we call it a beta keto ester. Now, clays and condensation is nothing more than a nucleophilic acyl substitution. That's all it is. And we saw, I mean, a thousand of those, it seems like, in um, in chapter 20. But in this case, just your, e your enolate is your nucleophile, and your electrophile is just the ester that is not deprotonated. That's all there is to it. Now, before I started recording this video, I was telling my students who are online, I told them, you know, that our textbook uses H3O plus for like everything, you know, it's like a magic reagent that can do just about anything. In this case, um, you know, is H3O plus reasonable? I suppose if it's dilute enough. However, maybe a, another thing you can think about is if you go back to your general chemistry two days, you might remember compounds like ammonium chloride, NH4Cl, which is a buffer. Um, but anyhow, ammonium chloride is a salt, but it's, it can also be used to protonate um, uh, the conjugate base of this, you know, to give you the product. And the reason why you want to be cautious with something like H3O plus is that you guys know that H3O plus is, is capable of hydrolyzing an ester. So you'd want to be very careful with that. But anyhow, I'm not going to quiz you on that or anything, but I did make a note of it one time when I was teaching this class and thought, well, it's a good point to bring up. So the mechanism, this is a mechanism we expect you to know, the mechanism of the Claisen condensation. So let's go over it. First step, I already drew that. So it's the pro, or I, sorry, I drew the enolate. But the first step is the proton transfer where you generate the enolate. And of course, the enolate is resonance stabilized. It's not showing that, but then it does a nucleophilic attack. This is the step I showed on the previous slide. You form your tetrahedral intermediate and you lose an alkoxide as your leaving group, right? And the driving force is going to be not only the formation of this carbonyl, but what really pushes the reaction forward, and you see that here in these arrows, they're the only ones that lie to the right-hand side, is the deprotonation of the 1,3-dicarbonyl. So, right, you have 1, 2, 3. So we call that a 1,3-dicarbonyl. And you know that this 1,3-dicarbonyl here, which is, again, the, the conjugate base of the beta-keto ester, this has three resonance forms, right? You could put the negative charge here, here, or here. And so it's highly resonance stabilized. And that is actually the driving force of the reaction. And so in order to get to the final product, right, this is just going to stop here. That's why you've got to treat it with H3O+. And of course, that's being shown here, okay? You, you could draw that mechanism in your sleep, I'm sure. So there you go. So that's the mechanism of a Claisen condensation. And it's a very important mechanism for you to know. However, um, a couple of things you have to know about the Claisen reaction or Claisen condensation is that there are some limitations to the reaction. Let me show you what they are. The first one is the starting ester has to have two alpha protons. So what does that mean? It means that if you go back here, right, if I go back here to this starting ester, okay, this starting ester has three alpha protons. So one two, three, like that, okay? So you've got to have, you've got to have at least two. So if you had a compound like this, like let's say you had this and here's your alpha carbon and then you had one, two, three, right? Let's say, say you just had two, right? So you have one enolizable proton. This would not work in a Claisen because you've got to have at least two carbons. 
So if I replaced one of those with a hydrogen, then that would work, okay? So you've got to have at least two enolizable protons. And the reason why is because of this step, okay? This step right here. Without the second proton, you can't form the co this conjugate base of the final product, which is the driving force of the reaction, okay? You, you need the first one to make the enolate, but you need this one to make the conjugate base, and that pushes the reaction forward. So that's number one. You've got to have two enolizable protons, or what we call two alpha protons is probably the way he describes it, okay? The next one is, if you're thinking, well, okay, all your conditions were, if you go back here, the conditions were just some sodium ethoxide. So maybe I could use methoxide or hydroxide. Well, it turns out you can't use sodium hydroxide in a clasin. So in a clasin, we'll put here OH minus. No, it's not going to work. Why is that? <laughs> Excuse me. It's because <coughs> if you use hydroxide, it's just going to hydrolyze any ester around, okay? And you guys know the proper term for the hydrolysis of an ester and base. It's saponification. Saponification. That's going to happen if you use hydroxide as your base, right? It's just going to attack your ester, and then you're left over with a carboxylate on it. And so that doesn't really help at all because you've just destroyed your starting material. That seems kind of useless, okay? So number one, two alpha protons. Number two, no sodium hydroxide or lithium, no hydroxide in a clasin. And the other one is this, is that whatever the alkyl group is of your ester, you have to choose an alkoxide that matches that group. So what it means is this, if you have an ester that looks like this, okay, if you have some kind of OR group, your alkoxide has to be RO minus. It, these R groups, this one and this one have to be the same. So if you're saying, does that mean if it's an ethyl ester, I have to use ethoxide? Yes. If it's a methyl ester, I have to use methoxide? Yes. If it's an isopropyl ester, I have to use isopropoxide? Yes. The reason why is because if you don't, if you have a mismatch, here we have an ethyl ester and somebody chose methoxide, bad choice. Why? Because that can act as a nucleophile. You just do a nucleophilic acyl substitution and now you've got a mixture. So now you've got the ethyl ester and the methyl ester, which is a real pisser because now you've got a mixture of products that you didn't even need. Um, so again, whatever, um, whatever the um, uh, ester is, you have to choose your alkoxide based off of whatever R group you have attached to the SP3 um, or sorry, attached to the oxygen. All right. So the next one, uh, crossed clasin reaction. If you understood crossed aldol reaction, you'll understand the cross clasin reaction. So you can do a cross clasin reaction if one of your esters has just, um, or sorry, if one of your esters has no, no alpha protons. So here we have no alpha protons in this ester, right? There isn't any here and there certainly isn't any on this side. And so in that case, you could make this um, enolate and then it's going to attack our compound that has no alpha protons and then you can push a few more arrows, and then you can do um, a, a cross clasin reaction that way. The other way is to do it just like the um, a directed aldol addition. So this is just, just like directed, directed aldol, aldol addition that I, that I talked about a few minutes ago. So you take LDA, you put your ester in there, it forms the enolate, then you add this into this reaction flask, and then it's going to do a nucleophilic attack. So that's another way to do it. So first one, no alpha protons. Yeah, that'll limit the number of products. Or you can do a, a directed clasin condensation, which is just like a directed aldol addition, same kind of concept. And we looked at the intramolecular aldol condensation reaction. Well, now we're going to talk about an intramolecular clasin condensation but this reaction has a name uh, that's named after a scientist, and it's called a Diekmann uh, cyclization. So the Diek, or sometimes you call it the Diekmann reaction. But anyhow, a Diekmann cyclization. So if we have two esters in the same compound, right? If we treat this with sodium methoxide, we're going to end up forming some of the enolate. Okay, and you can draw the curved arrows. You certainly don't need my help with it, right? You're going to form your tetrahedral intermediate. 
and then lose your ethoxide. Then you form this carbanion or this doubly stabilized enolate. Then you protonate it with H3O plus. And walla walla bing bang, you've got your product like that. So if you look at this compound very carefully, right, this is your alpha carbon. This is your beta carbon. So even though you're doing a cyclization, it's still just a beta keto ester. That's all it is. Okay. So it's nothing that novel or, uh, you know, it's the same old thing every single time. And just like I kind of harped on with the aldol reaction, when you're doing a Diekmann reaction, you're always going to form a five or six membered ring. Okay. You're, don't worry about, I'm not going to ask you to draw a three membered or four membered ring or something like that. It's not going to happen anyway. All right. So what it's asking for in this one is to give us the products of a, um, of a Claisen condensation. And so this is where it gets kind of interesting to start connecting carbons very carefully, okay? But I'm going to walk you through it and see if we can come up with an answer. So we're going to answer just the first one. And I'm going to save the second one for um, the 17th. So this one here we're going to do on the 17th. But let's try the first one. So what is going to happen here? When we treat this compound, now keep in mind we need ethoxide. So in this case we would use sodium ethoxide so we use i'll just put ethoxide like that so we're going to have the starting material right and we're also going to have this compound the enolate and then the enolate is going to be a nucleophile and it's going to attack the neutral ester like this okay and then we're going to form our tetrahedral intermediate now i'm not going to draw the whole dang thing but the bottom line is, is that this is our leaving group, okay? That part is going to be gone when we're all done, all right? So what are we going to have? We're going to have our alpha carbon. This one is going to be our beta, sorry, our beta carbon, and that's where the carbonyl is going to be. So after all the curved arrows are pushed, let's see what our final product is going to look like. So it's going to look something like this. So I have my aromatic ring, all right? Maybe I should color code it. So I'll kind of show you my rationale. So I'm drawing the molecule that I have in blue. Okay, or the portion I should say that I have in blue, like this. All right, so now I have a bond here. So this is my beta carbon, right? This is alpha, this is beta. So on the beta carbon, I'm going to have my carbonyl. So I'll put my carbonyl off like that. And now I'm gonna have my CH2 group and my aromatic ring up like that so there you go so there's my beta keto ester that i get in this specific case so i want you to try to draw the product for this one and again it's an ethyl ester so you're going to need ethoxide and i want you to try that one for monday and we'll draw it on monday all right the next one um i'll, I'll just go through the first one with you and kind of walk you through my rationale and this is not a David Klein thing. This is a Mr. Dion way of solving this. It says, identify the reagents that you would use to produce each of the compounds using a, um, a, a clasin. Well, this one's going to be a crossed clasin, right? This is a crossed, crossed clasin. How do I know that? Because it's made from two different esters. So here's how I do it. I do it like this. I say, here's my ester, okay? This is my alpha carbon. This is my beta carbon. That's where the bond is going to be formed. So that means that one of my starting esters is going to be this compound, okay? This is going to be ethyl propanoate, this guy here. And then if I'm doing a, a um, cross clasin reaction, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to treat this with LDA, right, to make this compound completely, right? So my reaction flask is only going to have that in it. And then after I make the the um, enolate, I'm going to add in my electrophile. So what's my electrophile going to be? It's going to be ethyl benzoate. So it's just the ethyl ester of this portion right here. And then in the last step, I need um, some H3O plus. So I'll put here three H3O plus, and that is going to give me the product. So what I want you to do um, for class on Monday, so we'll say here zero six, uh, is I want you to try this one. So here's alpha, here's beta. So this is where the bond is going to be formed. And I'll just kind of give you a hint on this one. This one also uses two different esters. So this one is also going to be a crossed 
a cross Claisen reaction, right? The cross Claisen reaction. Okay, next one, a couple of Dieckmann cyclizations. Well, let's just try one for now. The first one, so A, if we were to make the enolate of that, so we'd have the enolate here. And so if we count one, two, three, four, five, we're gonna form a five-membered ring. So we're gonna do a nucleophilic attack like this. We're gonna form a tetrahedral intermediate and we're gonna lose our leaving group. So if I draw the product that I'm gonna get from my Dieckmann cyclization, and again, this is just um, step one is gonna be sodium methoxide. Step two is gonna be H3O plus. What am I gonna end up with? I'm gonna have my six-membered ring. I didn't touch that. Then I'm going to have a five-membered ring attached to it, right? One, two, three, four, five. So on carbon number one, so let's number them. One, two. No, how did I do it? I did it like this. One, two, three, four, five. There we go. So on carbon number one, I've got the ester um, hanging off of it. Carbon two, carbon three, carbon four is just a methylene. And on carbon five, that's where I'm gonna have my ketone. So I'm gonna have my beta keto ester. So if you go back on all of these clays and condensations, and remember, a Dieckmann is just a type of claisen, okay? It's just a cyclic, cyclic claisen. If you're confused or if you're tired on a Friday afternoon and you're saying, well, how do I know when it's a claisen again? Look, here's an ester. Let's try it. I'll prove it to you so you won't forget it. You'll remember this over the weekend. Here's an ester. Here's the alpha carbon. Here's the beta carbon. What functional group is on beta? A ketone. This is a beta keto ester, right? Organic chemists were into keto way before it was cool, okay? So look at this starting material here. Here's your alpha. Here's your beta. What is it? It's a beta keto ester. What does that tell you? Claisen. Go back here. What's the product that you get? Here's alpha, here's beta. It is a ketone here. So this is a beta keto ester. What page is it on? It's on the Claisen page. Let's back up here. The Dieckmann cyclization, beta keto ester. So beta keto ester, what does that tell you? It's a Claisen. If it's cyclic, we give it a special name. We call it the Dieckmann reaction. Okay, so if you look at every single one of these, right, if we go right back to the beginning of the Claisen where we started after the break, okay, we go all the way back here. What was the Claisen? Every time you form a beta keto ester, all right? So what, what name comes to mind when you hear beta keto ester? Anybody? Better not be Colonel Sanders, I can tell you that. Nobody thinks it's Claisen? No one? Okay, I'll help you. It's Claisen. Okay, so beta keto ester is Claisen. Can you guys hear me? Hello. All right, cool. Kristen, were you thinking Claisen? Is that what you were thinking when you heard beta keto ester? Okay, all right. Fair enough, Kristen. Fair enough. Okay. So Kristen was just saying, she was saying, whenever I see a beta keto ester for the rest of my life, the wind will whisper, Claisen. <laughs> okay, you guys, I'm tired. Anyhow, so Claisen, and if it's cyclic, it's a Dieckmann, okay? I hope I spelled Dieckmann properly. Anyhow, there we go. All right. So there we go. All right, so now, again, whenever you guys see a beta keto ester, you're going to think the Claisen reaction. All right, uh, let's see here. Let's cover a couple more topics, and we'll call it a day for this beautiful, windy Friday. Let's talk about alkylation for a couple of minutes. And, uh, yeah, we'll see, if, we'll see a couple of concepts here about alkylation. It's kind of a cool reaction because I feel like by, like now you're in the second half of organic chemistry too, well into it. I bet you I could ask any of you the mechanism for this reaction and you wouldn't need any of my help whatsoever, right? You could all figure this out. You'd say, well, I know the LDA. <clears throat> LDA is a really strong base. 
So I have some alpha protons here and LDA is a super duper strong base. This is the structure, it looks like this. So it's gonna pull off this proton and then I'm gonna end up with this conjugate base over here. And then it's just, just gonna do an SN2, so nucleophilic attack, loss of leaving group, bada boom, bada bing. Great, right? I bet you all could have figured that out without my help. So there you go. So now you know how to add an alkyl group at the alpha position. But keep in mind that that was a symmetrical ketone. And if we're doing an SN2 reaction, there are, of course, there's limitations to SN2, right? SN2 works best what, with what? It works best with a primary or a methyl alkyl halide. Secondary and tertiary, nah, it's mostly going to give you E2 in that product. Uh, sorry, in that situation. Also, the aldol reaction is going to compete with any kind of alkylation. And so that's why you have to use a strong base like LDA. So if you're wondering, you know, could I use ethoxide here? No, it would be a bad choice because then you're going to have a mixture of the ketone and the conjugate, right? So you, and the enolate. So it's going to do, right? Then you're going to get aldol condensation products and aldol addition products and all kinds of junk. So you have to use LDA. So when you're doing alkylation, you have to use a very strong super strong base like LDA. All right. Now, if you have an unsymmetrical ketone, I was getting ahead of myself a few minutes ago. I was overly excited about this. Then there's two possibilities, right? You could form two different enolates. Let me show you what I mean. If you were to deprotonate this unsymmetrical ketone, right? This is not symmetrical. You've got two possibilities. You could either pull off the proton in blue, Ah, come on, big head. If you pull off the proton in blue, that's going to give you this enolate. Or you could pull off this proton in red, and that is going to give you this enolate. And we have names for both of those. The one in the blue circle, I know you guys know that one is more stable because it's tetra-substituted, or it has more groups on it, you could say. And the kinetic enolate or the one in the red circle is less substituted. So the one that's uh, more substituted, it's more stable. We call that the thermodynamic enolate, right? Because it's um, it's got a higher activation energy, but it's more stable overall. And then the kinetic enolate, well, that's got a lower activation energy because that this proton is more in the open, but you end up with something that is less stable. So it forms faster, yes, but it's not as stable. So this is kind of what I was just getting at, right? If you want to form the thermodynamic enolate, yeah, the activation energy is really high, okay? Really high activation energy, but you end up with something that's very stable. Whereas if you want to form the kinetic enolate, or if you do, right, the activation energy is really low, but then you get something that's not as stable. And so if you're wondering, could I, you know, could I get either one of these? Like, is there a way I could be selective about which proton I pull off? And the answer is, of course, yes. Okay, otherwise it wouldn't be teaching. It wouldn't be in the book, okay? So the way you do it is this, is if you want to form the kinetic enolate, you do it at a really low temperature, right? Low temperature is not going to take you over that high activation energy barrier. So you use a strong base like LDA and you use it at a low temperature. What do they mean by a low temperature? They use a negative, negative 78 degrees Celsius. And if you're saying, well, that's kind of a weird number to just pull out of a hat, okay? Why couldn't they just written minus 80? It's because if you mix um, uh, isopropanol with um, dry ice, so if you mix isopropanol and dry ice, it, it reaches minus 78, and chemists use it all the time to cool reactions, okay? Whereas if you do the reaction at room temperature, so What's room temperature? Well, it depends on the room, I suppose, but it's around 25 degrees Celsius. Um, if you do the reaction at room temperature and you use sodium hydride as your base, well, sodium hydride, think about it. Hydride is like the smallest, tiniest little base in the universe. So, of course, it can get in there and, you know, it's really stealthy and pull off that proton like that to give you um, the uh, thermodynamic product. So, there you go. So, that's how you, that's how you do it. All right. So this question is not meant to be a mind boggler or anything like that. The first one is obviously, you know, formation of the kinetic product, kinetic product, because you're in LDA and neg negative 78. And this one is thermodynamic 
product. Why? Because you're in sodium hydride. It doesn't give you a temperature. Therefore, it's inferred that it's a room temperature. So if I do the kinetic um, alkylation, uh, could anybody tell me, would I pull off the proton in red or the proton in green? Could anybody tell me which one of these I would pull off if I'm doing the kinetic product? Remember, I want to pull off the one that's going to be the fastest, the easiest one to pull off. Would it be the one in red or the one in green? Could anybody answer that? So if I do the one in red, it's going to give me the more substituted product. So that would be thermodynamic. So it's going to be the green one because it gives you something that's only mono substituted. Right? Does that make some sense? I'll draw them out for you, Kristen. So let's say we do the one in green. Then you end up with this enolate. Hopefully you can see that it's, it's in green. Okay. And then if you pull off the one in red, right, you would end up with this enolate. All right, so the one that's in green is, is less substituted, right? Does that make some sense? Yeah, okay, cool. So I'm just going to erase this one here, and I'll change the color of this one so it's more visible. There we go. All right, so then what's going to happen is you're going to alkylate that. So we're going to treat that with, come on, pen. We're going to treat that with our, um, with our uh, methyl iodide, so methyl iodide. So we do an SN2. Hello. There we go. And we're going to end up with our ketone. So now we've got an ethyl ketone on the, on the right-hand side. So if I do the thermodynamic product, would I pull off the proton in red? So I'm trying to put a proton here in red or the proton in blue. Anybody? Kristen, which one would I pull off? Or anybody? Would it be the one in red or the one in blue if I'm doing thermodynamic in this case? It's going to be the yeah, exact. Thanks, Mustafa. Awesome. It's going to be the red one, right? Heck yeah. So I'm going to end up with this one. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Like that. Then I do the SN2 with my benzyl bromide. So that's this compound. So I do nucleophilic attack, loss of leaving group. And there we go. So let me see if I can scribble this in here. All right, one, two. And there you have it, my friends. That's it. That's alkylation. Yep, alkylation, nothing to it. All right. So that brings us to the malonic ester synthesis. Malonic ester synthesis. I'll just level with you. You know, remembering the malonic ester synthesis, and then after that, we talk about, so we do the malonic ester synthesis. Then we do the acetoacetic ester synthesis. They're both super duper handy reactions. The hardest part is remembering them, okay? I don't know why, but students seem to struggle, and I, I struggled too when I was a student, remembering the difference between malonic ester and acetoacetic ester synthesis. I try to explain it to my students the best way I can. Um, but anyhow, so we're going to look at both of these. But before we get into that, let me just show you where we are. So if we go, I just want to show you how far we've gone in the chapter. So when you go to the review of reactions, let's cover, let's take a look at everything that we've covered. So we started out with alpha halogenation. That was the very first thing that we covered. Okay. Then we did, did we cover the hell volhard zielinski reaction? Of course, we looked at it today. Then we did the haloform reaction, which just really looks like magic in a way. But you take a methyl ketone, methyl ketone, and you end up with ketone, and you end up with a carboxylic acid in the end. It's a pretty remarkable reaction. I'd like to meet the person that invented it. Um, anyhow, so after that, we covered, so this is like what we covered today. We covered aldol addition, sodium hydroxide, water. Then we called covered aldol addition, so sodium hydroxide, water, and heat. Okay, so we covered both of those. Then we looked at crossed aldol reactions and intermolecular, intramolecular aldol condensation. Then after that, we got into the Claisen reaction, right? So what do we think of when we think of Claisen? We think of a beta keto ester, right? Beta keto ester, you think Claisen reaction. So then we looked at the cross Claisen, and then we said, when you have an intramolecular 
aldol condensation, it doesn't have a name, but if you have an intramolecular Claisen condensation, it does have a name, and it's named after a guy named Diekmann, okay? So it's nothing more than a cyclic Claisen is all it is, and we'll even scribble that in here. It's just a cyclic Claisen. This guy took all this credit for it. They even named it after him. Anyhow, uh, then we covered alkylation. So we talked about kinetic products, and then we talked about thermodynamic products, so thermodynamic. And so all we have left to cover are a couple of things. We have malonic ester synthesis, which starts with this compound here. This is called, um, this is called diethylmalonate. It's a diethylmalonate. And then the acetoacetic ester synthesis, which uh, we use ethyl acetoacetate for this. So um, ethyl acetoacetate. And I'll go over the names of both of these uh, with you. And then after that, we're, we're done. Uh, we just have to do Michael addition. So Michael addition and then the stork enamine synthesis and then Robinson annulation. So what we'll do is we'll save these for Monday afternoon. So again, on Monday afternoon, I'm going to cover malonic ester synthesis, okay? Acetoacetic ester synthesis. If you're looking at these and going, the, react, the reagents are the exact same, you're right. The only difference is in malonic ester synthesis, you make a carboxylic acid and acetoacetic ester synthesis, you make a methyl ketone. Then we're going to look at Michael additions, which we sometimes call conjugate addition. So sometimes we call Michael a conjugate, conjugate addition. It's, it's totally fine to call it that. Um, so we'll look at those in some detail. Then we'll look at stork enamine synthesis, and then we'll cover the Robinson annulation. Uh, and there you go. And in the Robinson annulation, I won't tell you which reactions are covered in here, but it's reactions we've already seen. So it's just two reactions we have seen. And maybe you can try to figure out which ones they are. Obviously, there's a condensation in there. Um, so there you go. All right.